on World News Tonight. Terror threats. The US government comes under fire following high tension talks on Afghanistan. New leader. Japan welcomes the Prime Minister-to-be in the latest party elections. Reforming bonds. The North and South Koreas shake hands on a long-lost connection. Stylish history. The bad boys of the past have their relics enshrined in a historical museum. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage from the government chaos in America. Republican lawmakers tried to pick apart President Biden's defense of his withdrawal from Afghanistan as they attacked his judgment and honesty during a second day of congressional hearings with top military leaders. Tonight, the nation's top military brass with a stunning warning on the growing terror threat following the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. It's a real possibility. Uh, in a not too distant future, 6, 12, 18, 24, 36 months, that time, the time frame, for reconstitution of al-Qaeda or ISIS. That, as for a second straight day, Joint Chiefs Chairman General Mark Milley, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, and CENTCOM Commander General Frank McKenzie were grilled over the chaotic exit, leaving Americans and Afghan allies behind now in danger of Taliban violence. Frankly, they're being slaughtered right now as we speak with our weapons, with our damn equipment. Our allies are being slaughtered. Yesterday, Milley and McKenzie contradicted President Biden after the president claimed none of his military advisors had recommended 2,500 troops stay in Afghanistan to avoid a Taliban takeover. Austin was pressed on it today. Milley was challenged about his phone call during the Trump administration with a Chinese general who he reportedly told, if we're going to attack, I'm going to call you ahead of time. Congresswoman Liz Cheney came to his defense. U.S. and the European Union trade and competition officials launched a new forum joining forces to better compete with China, shield sensitive technologies, boost semiconductor output and coordinate regulation of large technology firms. Let's cross over to other than a world news special correspondent Prashani Rodrigo who joins us now from Helsinki in Finland for more. Prashani. Yes, Shanali. EU Trade Chief Valdis Dombrovskis and other officials like U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken met with European Commissioner for Competition Margaret Vestager. The new U.S.-EU Trade and Technology Council held its first meeting in a former steel mill building in southeast Pittsburgh that has been repurposed as a research and development center for artificial intelligence, robotics and advanced manufacturing. With the U.S. and Europe trying to restrain the growing power of American tech giants such as Alphabet's Google, Facebook, Apple and Amazon, such cooperation has become critically important for regulators on both sides of the Atlantic. It also would make it harder for the U.S. tech industry to write new rules. The Council has 10 working groups and was expected to discuss areas such as chip, chip shortage, artificial intelligence and tech competition issues. Several tech trade groups in Washington said that the industry does not want the European approach to digital regulation to be adopted in the United States. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adh in a World News Special Correspondent Prashani Rodrigo reporting from Helsinki in Finland. Morocco and Algeria have expressed their dismay at France's decision to reduce the number of visas granted to nationals from Marburg countries, with Algeria summoning the French ambassador in protest. To get more details on this, other than a World News Special Correspondent Chetana Dharmaratna joins us now from Normandy in France. Chetana. Yes, Shanali. France said it would sharply reduce the number of visas granted to people from Algeria, Morocco and Tunisia, accusing the former French colonies of not doing enough to allow illegal immigrants to return. The move prompted Algiers to summon French ambassador François Guyet and had him a formal protest. The foreign ministry said in the statement, adding that the visa reduction caused confusion and ambiguity as to its motivation and its scope. In neighboring Morocco, Foreign Minister Nazar Burita told the reporters the French decision was unjustified and does not reflect 
the reality of consular cooperation in the fight against irregular migration. Unlike the neighbors, Tusinia had not reacted officially, but many of its citizens displayed the concerns in front of the officers of TLS contract, the only private company and authorized to receive applicants for France. The station said French President Emmanuel Macron to the decision a month ago after failed diplomatic efforts with the three North African countries. Back to you, Shanali. Thank you. That was Satadarana World News Special Correspondent Chetan Dharmaratna reporting from Normandy in France. Japan's former Foreign Minister Fumio Kishida won the ruling Liberal Democracy Party leadership race, virtually ensuring he will become the next Prime Minister. Fumio Kishida has edged out three other candidates to win the LDP's leadership race, a race that determined not only who will steer the Conservative Party, but also the person expected to become Japan's next Prime Minister. It's why Kishida spoke of national priorities in his victory speech. Fumio Kishida is a former foreign minister and a former banker. Seen as a consensus builder, his policies sit comfortably in the centre of his political family. The 64-year-old has promised to maintain the central bank's stimulus injections and propose a massive spending plan to help the post-pandemic economy. On foreign policy, he's turned more hawkish recently, suggesting that Tokyo should develop the military capacity to strike its enemies. Though a party heavyweight, Kishida is less known to the wider public and sometimes criticised for his lack of charisma. His immediate challenge will be to lift the LDP's plummeting popularity and ease the party through the next general election. Current lawmakers' four-year mandates are almost up. A national vote is to take place before the end of November. Kim Jong-un is now saying inter-Korean communication lines with South Korea will be restored in the coming days, adding his regime has no intent or reason to harm the South. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un made an appearance on the second day of the Supreme People's Assembly on Wednesday, following his absence from the opening session of the Assembly the day before. The regime's Korean Central News Agency reported that Kim said he is willing to restore inter-Korean communication lines in early October as part of efforts to improve relations and build peace on the Korean Peninsula. Kim said that the regime has no intention or reason to provoke or harm the South. But he also said that it's up to Seoul to determine whether inter-Korean ties can be improved, and said South Korea must forfeit its, quote, hostile policy before seeking to declare an end to the Korean War. The two Koreas had briefly restored cross-border lines in July. Before that, they had been cut for around a year, following the North's dramatic blowing up of the inter-Korean liaison office, in anger over the sending of anti-Pyongyang leaflets from the South. Pyongyang has not been answering Seoul's regular calls, expressing dissatisfaction at the joint military drills by the South and the U.S. Regarding the U.S., Kim claimed that Washington's military threats and hostile policies against Pyongyang have not changed at all and have become, quote, more cunning since the new administration took office early this year. Also at the Supreme People's Assembly, Pyongyang appointed the North Korean leader's influential sister to the regime's top government body. The North's ruling Workers' Party newspaper on Thursday said that Kim Yo-jong has been promoted to a position on the State Affairs Commission, the country's highest decision-making body. She is currently the vice department director of the ruling Workers' Party Central Committee. As for the vice chairman of the State Affairs Commission, the regime's current premier, Kim dok kun was elected. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back. Red hot lava from a volcano that devastated the Spanish island of La Palma reached the Atlantic Ocean late today, nine days after it started to flow down the mountain, wrecking buildings and destroying crops. This is the moment molten lava from the Cumbre Vieja volcano first spilled into the sea. As it continues to flow into the water, thick smoke rises into the air. Residents in three coastal villages have been told to stay at home to avoid harm from the release of toxic gases that can take place when the 1,000 degrees Celsius lava comes into contact with water. Since the volcano began its eruption on September 19th, the lava has destroyed more than 600 buildings as it slowly crept towards the sea. La Palma has yet to report any deaths or injuries, but more than 6,000 people have had to leave the area, a 
abandoning their homes and banana plantations. Even as the eruption shows no sign of slowing down, in some parts of the island, the cleanup has begun. On Tuesday, the government released 10.5 million euros in aid for people made homeless. The Canaries regional head estimated last week that the damage to land and property would exceed 400 million euros. Now moving on to the updates of the COVID crisis, France began requiring teenagers 12 and older to present a COVID-19 health pass to enter public sites such as restaurants, sport clubs or cinemas, extending a measure already in place for adults for two months. Until now, it's only been adults who've had to show a COVID health pass to access this swimming pool in Bordeaux. But from Thursday, teenagers over the age of 12 years and two months will also need one. The pass is now obligatory in gyms, bars and restaurants and cultural venues like museums. Half the members of this basketball team who train in a suburb just south of Paris haven't yet been vaccinated. The pass will be needed whether sports are being played inside or outdoors. September is usually when teenagers join clubs like this athletics one, but coaches are worried about numbers dropping off. Sports clubs are hoping those teenagers will return once the obligation to have a health pass is lifted by the French government. Just over 62% of those aged 12 to 17 have been fully vaccinated, compared to 72% of all adults. The U.S. CDC has made an urgent recommendation that pregnant women get vaccinated, including those who are pregnant, planning to become pregnant or breastfeeding. Tonight, a new urgent CDC health alert for pregnant women, urging them to get a COVID vaccine. New data show that symptomatic pregnant women have more than a twofold increased risk of requiring ICU admission and a 70 percent increased risk of death. The impact of the COVID-19 disease on pregnancy can be profound in a negative way. On the woman who's pregnant herself is at high risk for a severe outcome for COVID for her. The negative impact on the fetus is also very clear right now. Only around one in three pregnant women nationwide are vaccinated right now. Across the country, public health officials are stepping up their push and in some cases requirements to force people to get the shot. He's now one of more than 180 healthcare workers in the state suing their employers to stop vaccine mandates. In an effort to rise above fear-mongering on the internet, YouTube will now be imposing stricter measures to counter misinformation within its space related to COVID-19 vaccinations in hopes that it would encourage vaccine hesitants to get jabbed. Under pressure to combat misinformation on its platform, YouTube announced on Wednesday it will block all anti-vaccine content on the streaming site. YouTube already cracked down specifically on COVID-19 vaccine misinformation, but will now target content alleging that long-standing, commonly used vaccines cause chronic health effects. The Washington Post reported that YouTube, owned by Google parent Alphabet, will take down several channels and ban prominent anti-vaccine activists, including attorney Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and Joseph Mercola, who have long been high-profile figures in the anti-vaccine movement. The move comes as YouTube and other tech giants, such as Facebook and Twitter, face criticism for not doing enough to stop the spread of false health information on their sites. And they're, and they're killing people. U.S. President Joe Biden in July said COVID-19 misinformation spread on social media was, quote, killing people. Even as YouTube takes a tougher stance on misinformation, it faces backlash around the world. Moscow on Wednesday expressed outrage after YouTube deleted a Russian state broadcaster's German language channels for what the site said were breaches of its COVID-19 misinformation policy. Russia called the move, quote, unprecedented information aggression and threatened to block YouTube. Google did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Italian right police and climate activists clashed in Milan during a demonstration as energy and climate ministers were gathering for a pre-COP26 meeting. President of the 76th session of the United Nations General Assembly, Abdullah Shahid, expressed his gratitude to China for its efforts to tackle global challenges in an interview with China Media Group. 
Melbourne's COVID-19 cases surged to record levels with officials blaming illegal home gatherings to watch a key sporting event for the spike as a hard lockdown to combat the spread of the Delta variant near two months. Israeli and Palestinian human rights organizations are among the possible contenders to win this year's Nobel Peace Prize. The winner or winners are to be announced on October 8th. At least 30 prisoners died and another 48 were injured in a riot at an Ecuadorian jail. The government said the third deadly uprising this year in the Andean nation's prison system. Rolls-Royce has offered a sneak peek at its first fully electric car, fulfilling a prophecy for electric vehicles made by the Marquis founder in 1900 and the promise by the current boss to bring a fully electric car to the market this decade. Amazon's Alexa may not be the only smart gadget capable of upgrading your home space as the company introduced its latest little helper Astro, a bot designed to make technology the forefront of a comfortable home. Astro, join me on stage. Amazon on Tuesday summoned a household dog-like robot called Astro during its fall product event part of a new lineup of gadgets designed to make the e-commerce giant ever-present in consumers' homes. Even in homes as Alexified as mine, there are still lots of things my home can't do because my devices are stationary. This robot changes all of that. With Live View and the app, you can send it to check on specific rooms, things, people, even pets. Astro, which has digital eyes on a rotating screen mounted on wheels, is designed to take up tasks such as home monitoring, equipped with a periscope cam that can expand the field of view. It also sets up routines and reminders and can play TV shows and music while rolling around the house. <laughs> I just love that one. Amazon said the device is available at an introductory invite-only price of $999.99 and a regular price that's $450 more than that. Among other launches in its latest lineup were a smart thermostat, smart display Echo Show 15, and a new health tracking band called Halo View. Amazon has launched a number of new gadgets every year, including sunglasses with voice control and an in-home drone that have not become massive sellers. Shares of Amazon were down with the rest of tech on Tuesday, with the stock closing down more than two and a half percent. And finally tonight, a new exhibit celebrates lowrider culture, a form of expression for Latinos in the U.S. It was now once a social justice movement that transformed into an art form. Ready to roll. Cruising San Francisco's Mission District in Roberto Hernandez's 1964 Chevy Lowrider is both a thrill and a journey through a civil rights struggle. Young Latinos drove flashy cars that rode low, hopped, and danced on three wheels. Lowriding was labeled as bad boy behavior. We were stereotyped. Oh, wow, how can they afford these kind of cars? They must be selling drugs. Hernandez won his lawsuit against San Francisco's police. Now, 40 years later, he's curated a museum exhibit. Bow riders are in music videos, they're in movies, they're in commercials. Forcing the police to back down was only the start. We've become role models for other people in our community. Because we are human beings and we got, a, we got heart, we got soul, we got spirits. Once a symbol of bad boy behavior, now a celebration of Latino culture. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shinali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.